Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show moments away. Author Kelly Smith Tribble, but first, Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even thousands of miles before it hits your plate, Harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your own home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information to get your Rise Garden, you can visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Kelly Smith Trimble is an author, editor, writer, and master gardener living in Knoxville, Tennessee. Her second book, The Creative Vegetable Gardener, was released earlier this year. Welcome to the program, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're happy that you've joined us on the program. And I'm going to start with this question. Mulch is virtu- is a virtue to most gardens. What are your favorite ways to use mulch? And what are some of your favorite mulches to use in the garden? Yeah, so um, mulch is definitely very important in the garden. It helps shade the soil and um, protect protect the soil. I practice intensive planting, so planting things, you know, really pretty closely together. That helps in itself help shade the soil, so you don't really need as much mulch as you might if you were, you know, really spacing things out. But I do still mulch, and so um, I like to use compost as mulch throughout the season, so adding compost both to add nutrients, but also to kind of layer on top of the soil and shade the soil. And then I also will do a practice of using um, lettuce and um, other low-growing crops as a living mulch. So I'll like sow lettuce underneath taller crops like tomatoes or peppers to kind of shade the soil. But then I also use regular mulches too. So I tend to use cedar mulch. That's just one that I like in my garden. Um, I like straw mulch, but I found that I'm allergic to it. So I don't use straw mulch in my garden. So those are just a few of the mulch options that I like. Now, when you talk about using uh, lettuce at, or low-growing crops, now you're going to plant them about you know earlier, but you're not going to plant them when the plants, the tomatoes or peppers have a large canopy, correct? It's just in the early stages, or how does that work for yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I will, so, you know, kind of layering in terms of, of the timing of planting. So in the spring, I'll have um, greens, I'll have lettuce, and then I can... Um, plant tomatoes or something that's going to be more of a summer crop in the in the middle of that. And as the tomato will grow, the lettuce can um, can stay down at the the lower level and get shaded out by the tomatoes at the the higher level. So it's kind of a mutual benefit um, for both plants, and that and that enables me to have a longer um, harvest season for the lettuce as well. Absolutely. So. Many of us, you know, we learn from our mistakes in the garden. What is a major gardening mistake that you made and you're like, I'm never going to do that again that you definitely (laughs) learn from? Yeah. So I've made plenty of mistakes (laughs) in both life and gardening. And um, but one of them that I, you know, it's it's one of those mistakes that I I do regret, but, you know, not completely is planting my mint directly in my garden. So mint spreads through runners in the soil and at least where I live in the southeast it goes rampant and so I planted mint directly in my garden even knowing better (laughs) and I pull up wheelbarrow loads full of mint every season Um, spring summer and fall I have so much mint you know if I let it go it would just be a mint garden Um, the one that the type of mint that has grown that that spreads i feel like more than any other is apple mint um and i i planted one um just one little sprig of apple mint in my garden and now i have it everywhere um so i i pull that up all the time it was definitely a mistake to plant it directly in the ground but there are some benefits to it too because apple mint and and lots of mints but apple mint in particular has this beautiful purple bloom and it attracts tons of bees and beneficial wasps. So I do leave some of it in the garden. I don't pull all of it out. Um, But if I ever planted mint again in a different garden, I would plant it in a container. (laughs) Now, we encourage organic means of anything, and we don't judge those who do not choose to follow that. But for people who may have that issue, they may go to a, a very harsh chemical to kill off 
uh, right. the areas. Was that ever something that ever crossed your mind? Hey, I've got to control this. I, let's just kill it off and start again. No, it really hasn't. You know, I, I, um, I don't mind so much, you know, it was a mistake, but I don't mind so much pulling the mint out. You know, it smells good. It's, it's not really hurting anything. Um, in the garden, it's just taking up more space than I, you know, want it to take up, but it's not, um, you know, it's not like evil. So <laughs> there's worse things that could be growing. Yeah. There's worse things yeah. <laughs> to do than just pull up, you know, great smelling mint on a Saturday morning. So that's just what I do. Absolutely. So your newest book, The Creative Vegetable Gardener, was published a couple months ago. What's a tip or something in that book that will pique our listeners' interest or just encourage them to go out and get a copy? Yeah, so the book is full of tips. It's really um, pretty broad and covers lots of different topics. But one tip that I like to bring up um, is, is to let some of your crops bloom, crops that you wouldn't... Um, typically let bloom. So things that um, bolt in your garden and you normally will pull them out when they bolt. Like a lot of biennials do that. Um, carrots and parsnips and then some greens like lettuce and um, collard greens. Um, those are things that they, once they start blooming, they stop producing what we are usually growing them for, you know, the roots or um, the leaves. But if you leave those things in to bloom in your garden, there's a few benefits. Um, one is that a lot of them will attract pollinators, other beneficial insects to the garden. Parsnip blooms are absolutely beautiful. And when I've let them um, stay in my garden and bloom, they're just teeming with insects. Um, and then you also learn about the life cycle of those plants that you never would have you never would have seen a collard green or you know a collard or mustard bloom if you hadn't let that plant stay in the garden to, um, to bolt and bloom. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people would pull it, but I encourage people at least for, um, you know, an experiment to let things bolt and bloom in their garden just to see what happens. Carrot seeds is something that, yeah. you, but you have to keep that, you know, you understand that carrots have a, uh, I forget what the other wild, wild plant is. It's very similar to uh, carrot seeds when it looks like. Anyway. Like the wild parsnips or queen ants? Queen, queen ants. Oh, queen ants. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, but just neat to see how that little thing left alone can produce this really pretty flower and then have hundreds of seeds yeah. to save. It's just n yeah. neat. Yeah, absolutely. It is really neat. It's so I was watching, I uh, have some blooming collards um, in my garden right now. And I was watching actually this afternoon, birds come to those and start to harvest the seed pods from, from the collards. Um, so that was really neat just to see that it was, you know, feeding some wildlife in my garden. Absolutely. So in your book, you talk about planting in a labyrinth. So for those who don't know what a labyrinth is, what is that? And how do you suggest creating that in a smaller backyard or maybe just the feel of one? Yeah. So a labyrinth is, um, it's really a, a walking path, a winding walking path that is meant to encourage um meandering or like walking meditation. Um, it's similar in a way to a maze, if you can kind of picture a maze, except a maze is meant to confuse you and a labyrinth is really meant to, to calm you. So you're kind of just like walking on this path. Typically they go inward and then kind of come out again. And they're used in a lot of different spiritual practices and a lot of cultures throughout the world. Um, and I kind of included it in a in the book as an example of a different type of garden or a different type of landscape that could inspire garden design. Um, most people don't have the space necessarily um, to create a, a vegetable garden labyrinth in their backyard, although I have seen examples of them. Um, but a spiral is a really good example of kind of a simple um, version of a labyrinth. And the benefit to me of that is this idea that you kind of can be in inside your garden and you can use um, the garden as both a space of production, but also a space of kind of meditation and calming. Um, and so there is a, a great example of a spiral garden. Um, uh, it's a garden actually in Wisconsin, um, an artist who created this garden that is a really fun spiral shape. So that I think kind of mimics the idea of, of a labyrinth. A place of calming. I, I think whether you're in the garden or in the woods, uh, we all need 
a, a time of calming in the society that we live in. Yes, absolutely. The garden can can really provide that. And I think um, taking that into account when you're designing your garden um, can really increase that benefit for you. Is the, is the garden that you're referring to in Wisconsin, is that the one in West Bend? or It's in Kenosha. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. I know there's a small labyrinth um, creative garden in West Bend, but I'll have to... Looking yeah, I think Kenosha. I've I think I've heard of that. This this is a, a a woman, an individual in Kenosha, Wisconsin. She's an artist, and I found her garden just looking at hashtag Spiral Garden <laughs> on Instagram, and it's really probably my favorite garden in the book. I just love it. Well, you encourage people to plant perennials and annuals paired together, and some people may think that that's counterintuitive. What are some of your favorite ways to do so, and, and how does that work? Yeah, I mean, there are um, reasons to not plant perennials and annuals together, and there are definitely some perennial crops that I think do deserve their own spot. Asparagus is definitely one of those because it stays in the same space for so many years. It can grow, you know, for 15 years or so. But um, I do think there are some perennials that can be good pairs with annual crops and that can kind of anchor um, an annual vegetable garden. Um, Some of those are edible, some are not edible. Some of the edibles are more leaning towards herbs. So perennial herbs um, like rosemary and sage, tarragon, thyme. These are plants that I have kind of interspersed throughout my garden um, where I do plant my annuals. And so they're things that, at least in my area, I can harvest um, some of them throughout the winter um, and they can provide some winter interest, but they can also provide some pest control when they're paired with with the annual crops. Um, and then I also include some you know, tender perennials that are not edible, like um, echinacea is one that I really love. It attracts pollinators in the summer. Bees are all over it. And then um, even though it dies back in the winter, I leave some of those um, brown stalks in the garden through the winter and um, native bees can um, nest in there. Other insects can nest in there. So there can be multiple benefits of including perennials, um, both edible and non-edible perennials in the space where you're going to be gardening um, or growing annuals. Fantastic. So we've really enjoyed having you on the program. How can our listeners find out more about you and get your great books? Yeah, so you can find the books, um, Vegetable Gardening Wisdom and The Creative Vegetable Gardener, anywhere you buy books online, as well as, um, you know, hopefully um, visiting your local bookstores. If you don't see it there, I'd love for you to ask for them to to get it for you. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram at Kelly Smith Trimble. And I do have a website. It's kellysmithtrimble.com. Um, not as active there on the website, more on social media. So um, yeah, I hope you will look for the the books and and follow me, follow me, follow along with me. Well, Kelly, we greatly appreciate the time and the knowledge you've shared with Holly and myself and all of our listeners today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.